growing up. It's time to grow up. So, um, in paragraph four, uh, Dr. Jung is talking about the fact that the psyche is its own goal. In other words, the, the self, which is the second center of the psyche in Jungian analysis, the two being ego and self, uh, the, the self or the God image has its own um, goal. And so you may have to do some analysis to find out what the goal of the self is. And so that's uh, the next level. And he also points out that uh, treatment of a neurosis opens up other problems uh, for the individual because things start moving around in the unconscious. Um, paragraph five, he's talking about the fact that the true physician, the true uh, analyst is in the middle of the work. So they're not outside the work. They're actually in it with the patient. And uh, they're, as he says, stripped of all human pretense. So they're just in the soup too. And uh, you may remember that Dr. Jung uh, used to joke uh, when people came to him for the first time, he would say, ah, so you're in the soup too. <laughs> and then the, then the analyst gets right in the soup with the patient. Um, then in paragraph six, he's talking about the, the right way to wholeness, the right way to complete the individuation process is serpentine and it's not lacking in terror. So in other words, um, it, there, it suggests difficult things come up. And so doing it with an analyst uh, can be useful. Um, you know, what I've found from a layman's perspective, and I'm not a mental health professional, is that by knowing about these things, I'm pretty much able to uh, follow this along and find my serpentine route, but not everybody can do that. Um, and so um, in paragraph seven, then Dr. Jung is talking about the fact that religions excel in rationalistic systems. Um, but if they keep going, what happens is they tend to turn into superficial and formal, excuse me, uh, their ideal, the, the ideal of the re religion loses its life in effect because it turns into a superficial and formalistic way of uh, addressing the believers. And so, um, you know, if, you've go, if you go to church and you find yourself not moved, uh, that's because they're just going through the motions and they don't really know how to engage um, the religious function. And uh, that often happens in church, in my experience. And also in paragraph uh, seven, he's talking about the need for education in religion to help people understand what it is that religion is doing for you. And, you know, one of the big problems in Christianity is that there are these myths which um, the scientific method has punched holes in, and yet, um, and we can take things that, you know, this, <laughs> the low hanging fruit here, like uh, the virgin birth, things of that sort. And so obviously the uh, scientific method has punched holes in myths like that. But the point is that religion is about the psyche. It's not about the physical world. And so in the psyche, such things can exist. There can be angels, there can be a God, and so on. And in fact, uh, the God image uh, is in all of us. Hello, Sean, nice to see you tonight. Uh, <laughs>
Sean says, cool soup reference. I like that very much. And that was uh, Dr. Jung's favorite line, I think, because he pulled that one out on everyone. Okay, so then, um, in also in paragraph seven, Dr. Jung is talking about uh, the imitatio Christi, which is the idea that we as Christians, if we're Christians, we're supposed to imitate Christ. But the problem is that the way the church went about that, it never caused the inner man to imitate Christ. It was only a, a pretend Christ. So, you, for example, I mean, in places like the Philippines, for example, people actually get themselves nailed to crosses and, and put up to hang for an hour, nailed to a cross, so that they're imitating Christ. But that isn't what was intended, and that isn't what you're supposed to do, because that's in the physical world, and you're supposed to imitate Christ in, the, in your inner self. And so that's a very significant differentiation. And so the result is that uh, religions tend to... Um, turn superficial and formalistic, um, and they no longer really get through to their worshipers. So you can go to church, and it can be a nice community of friends in the community that get along together and have nice potluck suppers uh, to go to, but it never touches the inner man. And this is one of the big issues that Dr. Young raises in this part of psychology and alchemy. Um, and what he says is that um, man is untouched at the deepest levels. And so we, what we see in the history of the 20th century is really pure paganism. You know, how could the Christian God even do such things? Well, the Christian God wasn't doing those things. It was pagan. Um, and he says, many do catch a glimpse of inner wholeness, and it feels like grace, but the question is, how do you keep that going in your own life? And so those were uh, my observations from paragraphs uh, one through seven. I'm now going to go ahead and read these paragraphs, and then we'll discuss them in uh, more detail as we begin uh, the 2019 series of sessions uh, that will run in the Monday night group. So, um, I'm, and I'm willing to take any questions or comments you may have as I go forward. This is only going to be about four pages, I think. Um, my notes are actually as long as Dr. Young's writing. <laughs> so anyway, here's uh, Psychology and Alchemy by C.G. Young. I'm reading from volume 12 of the Collected Works of C.G. Young, published by Princeton University Press. And so uh, paragraph one. For the reader familiar with analytical psychology, there is no need of any introductory remarks to the subject of the following study. But for the reader whose interest is not professional and who comes to this book unprepared, some kind of preface will probably be necessary. <laughs> you think <laughs> the concepts of alchemy and the individuation process are matters that seem to lie very far apart so that the imagination finds it impossible at first to conceive of any bridge between them. To this reader, I owe an explanation, more particularly as I have had one or two experiences since the publication of my recent lectures, which lead me to infer a certain bewilderment in my critics. Now, uh, this was... Uh, let's see when this was first published. Uh, I think it was 1944. Um, 
this version of it was published. Yes. Uh, okay, well, these lectures uh, were from the Aranos conferences in 1936-1937, and Psychology and Alchemy in German was first published in 1944 and revised in 1952. The English version, it seems, was first published in 1953. So that was paragraph one. Paragraph two. What I now have to put forward as regards the nature of the human psyche is based first and foremost on my observations of people. It has been objected that these observations deal with experiences that are either unknown or barely accessible. It is a remarkable fact, which we come across again and again, that absolutely everybody, even the most unqualified layman, thinks he knows all about psychology, as though the psyche were some, something that enjoyed the most universal understanding. But anyone who really knows the human psyche will agree with me when I say that it is one of the darkest and most mysterious regions of our experience. There is no end to what can be learned in this field. Hardly a day passes in my practice that I do not come across something new and unexpected. True enough, my experiences are not commonplaces lying on the surface of life. They are, however, within easy reach of every psychotherapist working in this particular field. It is therefore rather absurd to say the least that ignorance of the experiences I have to offer should be twisted into an accusation against me. I do not hold myself responsible for the shortcomings of the lay public's knowledge of psychology. Paragraph 3. There is an analytical process, that is to say, in the dialectical discussion between the conscious mind and the unconscious, a development or an advance towards some goal or end, the perplexing nature of which has engaged my attention for many years. Psychological treatment may come to an end at any stage in the development without one without one's always or necessarily having the feeling that a goal has also been reached. Typical and temporary terminations may occur. One, after receiving a piece of good advice. Two, after making a fairly complete but nevertheless adequate confession. Three, after having recognized some hitherto unconscious but essential psychic content whose realizations gives a new impetus to one's life and activity. Four, after a hard-won separation from the childhood psyche. Five, after having worked out a new and rational mode of adaptation to perhaps difficult or unusual circumstances and surroundings. Six, after the disappearance of painful symptoms. Seven, after some positive turn of fortune, such as an examination, engagement, marriage, divorce, change of profession, etc. Eight, after having found one's way back to the church or creed to which one previously belonged, or after a conversion. And finally, nine, after having begun to build up a practical philosophy of life, a philosophy of the classical sense of the word. Paragraph 4. Although the list could admit to many more modifications and additions, it ought to define by and large the main situations in which the analytical or psychotherapeutic process reaches a temporary or sometimes even a definitive end. Experience shows, however, that there is a relatively large number of patients for whom the outward termination of work with the doctor is far from denoting the end of the analytical process. It is rather the case that the dialectic, dis 
It is rather the case that the dialectical discussion with the unconscious still continues and follows much the same course as it does with those who have not given up their work with the doctor. Occasionally, one meets such patients again after several years, and here's the often highly remarkable account of their subsequent development. It was experiences of this kind which first confirmed me in my belief that there is in the psyche a process that seeks its own goal independently and independently of external factors, and which freed me from the worrying feeling that I myself might be the sole cause of an unreal and perhaps unnatural process in the psyche of the patient. This apprehension was not altogether misplaced in as much as no amount of argument based on any of the nine categories mentioned above, not even a religious conversion or the most startling removal of neurotic symptoms, can persuade certain patients to give up their analytical work. It was these cases that finally convinced me that the treatment of neurosis opens up a problem which goes far beyond purely medical considerations and to which medical knowledge alone cannot hope to do justice. Martin asks, do you think this is exploration in consciousness itself or one's own psyche? Uh, it, it's both, Martin, uh, because uh, this book, as I read it the first time and wrote a review of it a few years back, um, this book is basically a history of the human mind, and so it's both individual and collective. Um, and... Uh, then Carl Jung, Deb Psychology, correctly notes, too much of the animal distorts the civilized man, too much civilization makes sick animals from Collected Works 7, paragraph 32. And again, the self is our life's goal, for it is the com uh, completest expression of that fateful combination, combination we call individuality. And that's from Collective Works 7. Um, paragraph 404, and I just mentioned that it was Dr. Jung's perspective that the psyche is evolving throughout one's lifetime, and individuation is about achieving wholeness, about experience, everything. So, you know, when you're first a little baby, uh, the first things that you're doing are... Um, you realize that there's light in the room and so you very slowly open your eyes and notice that there's light and then there's color around and then you start exploring what's in that light and you find out who mom is and <laughs> all that sort of thing and so your psyche is always teaching you and and causing you to open your eyes and be uh, smarter and smarter as you go on and it requires you to learn basically um, so anyway going on paragraph five although the early days of analysis now lie nearly half a century behind us with their pseudo biological interpretations and their depreciation of the whole process of psychic development Memories die hard, and people are still very fond of describing a lengthy analysis as running away from life, unresolved transference, or autoeroticism, and by other equally unpleasant epithets. Uh, we'll note that this uh, that was referring to 50 years earlier, but now we're at 100 years earlier. But since there are two sides to everything, it is legitimate to condemn this so-called hanging on as negative to life 
only if it can be shown that it really does contain nothing positive. The very understandable impatience felt by the doctor does not prove anything in itself. Only through infinitely patient research has the new science succeeded in building up a profounder knowledge of the nature of the psyche. And if there have been certain unexpected therapeutic results, these are due to the self-sacrificing perseverance of the doctor. <laughs> maybe of <laughs> maybe of people like Louis Lafontaine and and uh, Skip because we keep presenting these things out to people who haven't gone to see a doctor. Unjustifiably negative judgments are easily come by and at times harmful. Moreover, they arouse the suspicion of being a mere cloak for ignorance, if not an attempt to evade the responsibility of a thoroughgoing analysis. For since the analytical work must inevitably lead sooner or later to a fundamental discussion between I and you, and you and I, on a plane stripped of all human pretenses. It is very likely, indeed it is almost certain, that not only the patient but the doctor as well will find the situation getting under his skin. Nobody can meddle with fire or poison without being affected in some vulnerable spot, for the true physician does not stand outside his work but is always in the thick of it. So I'm not in the thick of it for you. I'm not a mental health professional, and uh, I don't offer uh, analyses of people's dreams. Uh, sometimes I analyze my own dreams, but I don't do it for people um, that I don't know. Uh, and so if you think you need a mental health professional, please do go see one. Uh, what I have found, though, over my uh, last 30 plus years, and I think others who may be listening to this today uh, may have found, is that even without a doctor, it's possible for conscientious readers of Dr. Young's work to have um, basically a analysis light within your own heart uh, without having to go to a professional. And I, I feel that's what has happened with me, and I think that may be what's happened to many others. Paragraph six, this hanging on, as it is called, may be something undesired by both parties, something incomprehensible and even unendurable, without necessarily being negative to life. On the contrary, it can easily be a positive hanging on, which, although it constitutes an apparently insurmountable obstacle, represents just for that reason a unique situation that demands the maximum effort and therefore enlist the energies of the whole man. In fact, one could say that while the patient is unconsciously and unswervingly seeking the solution to some ultimately insoluble problem, the art and technique of the doctor are doing their best to help him towards it. Uh, there's a Latin phrase here which isn't translated, but I'll give it to you. Ars totem requirit hominem, exclaims an old alchemist. It is just this homo totus, this total human, whom we seek. The labors of the doctor as well as the quest of the patient are directed towards that hidden and as yet unmanifest whole man who is who is at once the greater and the future man. But the right way to wholeness is made up, unfortunately, of fateful detours and wrong turnings. It is the logissima via, not straight, but snake-like, a path that unites the opposites in the manner of the guiding caduceus. Caduceus is the symbol of medicine that has two snakes on it. 
path that unites the opposites in the manner of the guiding caduceus, a path whose labyrinthine twists and turns are not lacking in terrors. It is on this legissima via that we meet with those experiences which are said to be inaccessible. Their inaccessibility really consists in the fact that they cost us an enormous amount of effort. They demand the very thing we most fear, namely the wholeness which we talk about so glibly and which lends itself to endless theorizing, though in actual life we give it the widest possible berth. It is infinitely more popular to go in for compartmented compartment psychology, where the left hand pigeonholed does not know what the right is doing. And so that would be not holding the, the opposites in consciousness and therefore not integrating and therefore not achieving a conjunctio as we'll be discussing later. Paragraph seven. I'm afraid that we cannot hold the unconscious and the impotent and the impotence of the individual entirely responsible for this state of affairs. It is due also to the general psychological education of the European. Not only is this education the proper concern of the ruling religions, it belongs to their very nature. For religion excels all rationalistic systems in that it alone relates to the outer and inner man in equal degree. So this is a very positive endorsement for religion from Dr. Jung, because he points out that their systems reach both the outer and the inner man. We can accuse Christianity of arrested development if we are determined to excuse our own shortcomings. But I do not wish to make the mistake of blaming religion for something that is due mainly to human incompetence. I am speaking, therefore, not of the deepest and best understanding of Christianity, but of the superficialities and disastrous misunderstandings that are plain for all to see. The demand made by the Imitatio Christi that we should follow the ideal and seek to become like it ought logically to have the result of developing and exalting the inner man. In actual fact, however, the ideal has been turned into, the ideal has been turned by superficial and formalistically minded believers into an external object of worship. And it is precisely this veneration for the object that prevents it from reaching down into the depths of the psyche and giving the latter a wholeness in keeping with the ideal. Accordingly, the divine mediator stands outside as an image, while man remains fragmentary and untouched in the deepest part of him. Christ can indeed be imitated even to the point of stigmatization without the imitator coming anywhere near the ideal or its meaning. Uh, witness the Filipinos who have themselves nailed to a cross. You can imitate, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to achieve the ideal. For it is not a question of an imitation that leaves a man unchanged and makes him into a mere artifact, but of realizing the ideal on one's own account, deo concedente, in one's own individual life. We must not forget, however, that even a mistaken imitation may sometimes involve a tremendous moral effort, which has all the merits of a total surrender to some supreme value, even though the real goal may never be reached and the value is represented externally. It is conceivable that by virtue of this total effort, a man may even catch a fleeting glimpse of his wholeness, accompanied by the feeling of grace that always characterizes this experience. So you can catch a glimpse of it um, with a religious experience, perhaps, but it doesn't necessarily mean you've yet achieved wholeness, as I've 
said many times to the group, um, I have religious experiences often, um, including on Christmas Eve two nights ago, um, but I don't claim to be fully individuated as yet, <laughs> and I keep working on it. So anyway, so this has been a first stab at beginning of psychology and alchemy. Um, the from the collected works of C.G. Young, volume, seven, uh, volume 12. And I'm going to continue to do readings um, in this manner where I provide some of my own commentary and the actual reading of the text um, in preparation for uh, more detailed discussions in the group starting in January and throughout the year 2019. Uh, this is a truly monumental task. Um, the book itself is 571 pages long, and I'm on page seven. It's, <laughs> it's not a book that you read like a novel. And as you see, I've found a lot of things in it that I thought were important. Every one of those tabs represents a quote in that this text that I think I could write an essay about. And uh, there are probably many more. Also, I try to be judicious about where I put these tabs because as you see, then it's hard to differentiate them. Although I try to color code it a little bit. Um, but in any case, I will continue uh, to do some of these readings. We'll see how it goes and we will uh, discuss them uh, in the reading group. And so you can re-listen to this video in preparation for our meeting on January the 7th at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Um, let's see what else. All right, I, I see no other questions or comments, uh, so I'm going to uh, terminate for today. Uh, tomorrow I will uh, begin with paragraph eight, and this next few paragraphs are going to be extremely challenging because they really get into uh, Dr. Jung's most important insights about religion and psychology. So I'm not sure that I'm going to um, do more than one paragraph per video. I'm, it may be only one. And Willem asked me, how many times have I read the book? Well, I would say I've read the whole book once, and uh, and I did a review on it, which you can find on the Archetype in Action website. Um, and let's see, maybe I can get that for you fairly quickly. Um, so you can review of the book which was written uh, several years ago. And um, if I can find it quickly, I will give it to you. Of course, because I'm streaming, that my, my uh, internet is very slow, and also because everybody's home for the holidays, I suppose. Um, let's see, it's coming up, however. I am hopeful. Um, let's see. Hmm. With luck, I can find this because it's uh, this is an incredibly complex website at this point. Um, hmm. Let's see. Give me a 
that's not a good read pattern. Okay, I guess I'm going to let it let it go at that. Um, unless this is going to give it to me right now. I'm on the page, but um, if it comes up on this try here might yep there it is okay so I did this review in in 2014 um, my live dash go okay so here is the link to my review. And uh, so <laughs> So Sigmund Freud is the industrial um he is the um physical world materialist version of psychology um, and Dr. Jung is the psyche version of psychology and religion and when you have both when you understand both then you'll really have something but uh, you can't have Freud without having Jung or you're uh, just going to be doing patches like the Freudians will give you um, my understanding is the Freud's Freudians will give you uh, drugs to uh, solve your depression uh, I think Jungian analysts are much less likely to do that they would rather find the source of your problem uh, rather than just uh, band-aid it over with drugs and such and so I think that Dr. Jung's approach is going to come into its own as last year we killed 72,000 people with drug overdoses. So I think drugs generally in the U.S. are going to be given much less frequently and other means of solving all kinds of physical ailments are going to be explored, but particularly in uh, psychiatric uh, cases and uh, psychological cases is my guess. I'm not, a, once again, I'm not a mental health professional and so I'm, I, you can't take anything I say as mental health advice. You need to go to an actual uh, mental health professional for that. Have I any thoughts, Martin asks, on Freud's personality type? Um, I've heard many people talk about Freud being an extrovert. I I rather doubt that because I don't think you get thinking about dreams and the psyche by being an extrovert. But um, but I think he was an S, a sensing person, which meant he had to get all the details, and uh, he was a T, a thinking person and uh, he was a very judgmental person, a judging person. So uh, I would say he was ISTJ, 
that's my guess. That's a pure guess. Uh, but others may say it was ESTJ. Um, and, uh, you know, we can continue to discuss that in the next a few times. I, I haven't looked it up and uh, and I suppose if we just googled what was um, Freud's personality type we might get it. Uh, in the case of Dr. Jung it's quite clear that he was an I-N-T uh, um, and he was probably a J, I-N-T-J, uh, because he was so fastidious about getting every citation to everything he ever said in his collected works and because he was that fastidious i have to ex assume that he was a j and he was certainly introverted intuitive and uh, thinking uh, although he was thinking but then he was developing his feeling side uh, through all of his um, endeavors over um, basically over his lifetime because the uh, Red Book period was obviously a very feeling process where he was experiencing his uh, inferior side and uh, as he said he had to kill the hero so the hero was his uh, uh, rationalistic German rationalistic point of view and uh, so so Martin says ISTJ uh, and Martin's Martin so Martin says that um, that Freud was ISTJ and I, I can concur with that possibility. I, I think you're talking about Freud there, Martin. And uh, he says that uh, he wants Jung to be INFJ. I, I acknowledge that he may be INFJ and that um, when he went to school, he got trained in the scientific method and he was always very fastidious about identifying himself as a scientist so in a sense he he may have had some inferiority complex about whether he was being an adequate scientist which would require um, a thinking function but the fact that he was always uh, assuring everybody that he was uh, doing things by a scientific method and that he was a scientist might suggest that he was actually an F because as we know people who are feeling inferior about something uh, tend to uh, overcompensate um, and um, we certainly see that on our television every day um, and so he may have been an I INFJ and so when he went into his uh, Red Book period of uh, visioning um, he was you know letting his natural um, behavior come to the fore and in you know in my case um, I am INTP um, and what that means and and yet I was you know I, for 23 years I was a Marine Corps officer and Marine Corps officers tend to be STJ and so I was trained just as I'm suggesting um, Dr. Young may have been trained in the scientific method I was trained in the Marine Corps method and so whenever I put my uniform on I feel myself becoming STJ even to this day and so I do sometimes put my uniform on to do honor salutes with my fellow veterans and when I do I, I definitely feel uh, this STJ persona 
uh, coming over me. But um, you know, if we look at my work on this uh, YouTube channel, uh, it is it tends to be more P because I, I'm not that fastidious about getting citations and that sort of thing. I'm trying to spark your interest so that you can go find out what it is I'm talking about or see if you agree. And I really don't care if you agree. I, here, here's what, why I'm doing it and what I know. Why I'm doing it is because for the last 32 years, I've been exposed to Dr. Jung's work one way or another, and I know that it has helped me in my life. And I've made many accomplishments in that period of time, and um, not related to um, mental health per se, but because I was able to face some of the slings and arrows of life uh, it has certainly helped me in my in doing that and because that happened i feel that i want to share that possibility with others and so that's what i'm doing here and you know i don't care if you get it or not <laughs> if you get it you get it and i'm glad i'm helpful if not then i suppose you won't watch the next video um but i'm i'm okay both ways <laughs> so anyway those are my thoughts about it um and uh and so martin also says uh, he wants dr Jung in the infj camp we own him well, I think that uh, the, the spirit of Dr. Jung uh, will be owned in its own way, <laughs> no matter what we say about it. <laughs> you know, I, I, I do concur that it's very likely that if he had been tested by this system, the Myers-Briggs type indicator, um, throughout his life he may have he may well have come into this infj category um and uh but i think he was also a chameleon he could be whatever he needed to be when he was um interviewing a patient i suppose and that's that's the uh, creativity i suppose of a of a psychoanalyst to do that um, and um, and I, I don't think you have to be rigid in these things as I say you know I have no trouble whatsoever in putting on the persona of a Marine Corps officer if I want to and um, uh, and when I was becoming a Marine Corps officer, um, it never occurred to me that my, because I didn't know about personality types, it never uh, occurred to me that my personality type would be uh, a handicap for me in my Marine Corps career, uh, which it was not. Um, and as I've often said, the, the, um, the top, uh, officers um, in the military are probably uh, NTJ, but maybe NTP also because they're if they're perceiving, then they're not making uh, mistakes. I know that um, officers that don't get that very high tend to be STJ uh, up until two stars. Two stars, uh, those are the men who say, give me a mission and I'll go accomplish it. But the ones that get to three and four stars are people who understand politics. And, and so if you look at 
an example like uh, General Mattis or uh, General Kelly or um, uh, Colin Powell as examples. Um, those are not classic uh, STJ men. Uh, just uh, an observation. Okay, so I'm going to discontinue for today. I will probably tomorrow continue on uh, from paragraph 8. I have con uh, prepared some notes for, for the next few paragraphs, but I warn you they are very complex and I have been struggling with my notes. So they're, they're, they are going to be complex paragraphs and they do relate to Dr. Jung's perspective about religion generally. So I'll terminate for today and look forward to seeing you another time. Thank you for coming today.